Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Wilden, and it is my honor and delight to be the executive director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College in the wilds of Western Massachusetts. Um, I want to first express our gratitude to Berkshire Gas, which has graciously underwritten our online author series for over a year now, allowing us to offer them to you free of charge. Thank you, Berkshire Gas. And thank you also to our newest OLLI staff member, Ray Langsdale, who is here behind the scenes today to help ensure all goes well. But I have to say, if it doesn't go well, it's, it's not Ray's fault. So they're absolved. We're also, of course, very grateful to, to today's author for joining us today. John Dixon is especially uh, beloved to us because he is both an OLLI at BCC member and an OLLI instructor. John has taught and moderated a number of OLLI courses, including our annual Great Decisions course, and perhaps most significantly, a course called, once you know it, History Shock several years ago, which helped lead to this book. So uh, we're very proud of that. And History Shock uh, really brings together um, his love of history with his decades of experience as a foreign service officer. Since retiring and moving to the Berkshires, he went back to school because he's a lifelong learner and got an, a master's degree in public history and has really um, taken a deep dive into local history. He's on the board of the Berkshire Historical Society. Are you still the chair of the Pittsfield Historical Commission? Yep. And, uh, and serves in a number of ways. And you've written several books about local history too. Is that correct? I wrote one, I wrote oh. one on uh, Berkshire County Mills, the industrial heritage. It was a, yeah. a local history Arcadia book. Yeah. 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 And, and a website on the, on those mills as well. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Fabulous stuff. So, but uh, for over 25 years, um, he served the United States as a foreign service officer in North America, South America, the Caribbean, and Africa. That's covering a lot of ground. In his new book, History Shock, When History Collides with Foreign Relations, uh, which was published by the University Press of Kansas this year, he offers valuable insights into the daily life of a foreign service officer and the work of representing the United States, but really sets that into the much bigger picture of the challenges of um, foreign relations when the history of Foreign relations is really not taken into account. I, I won't. We. I will not read the whole description um, of the book because I would much rather hear it from uh, John himself. So please join me in welcoming John Dixon. Uh, uh, thank you, Meg Megan, very much, and thank you, Ollie. You know, obviously, as you said, I'm a big fan of of Ollie and have been uh, involved with Ollie for uh, uh, eight years anyway. Uh, <clears throat> And as Megan said, it, uh, it, the first class I did teach with Ollie uh, really uh, helped propel this book forward as the research I had to do for that class ended up as in several chapters of the book. Um, and, and I know it's dinner time. I've had a, a, I've been a, a member or a participant on some of these uh, talks at 7 p.m. So enjoy your dinner. And uh, uh, as we talk, that's probably why you're muted so we wouldn't hear the uh, clang of uh, utensils and, uh, and, and, and uh, plates. Anyway, uh, onto my book, as Megan said, my book was a bit of a personal exploration. Uh, I, I was trying to find out the connection between history and memory in the conduct of our foreign, af foreign affairs, foreign relations. I, I, foreign relations is really the, the management of relations we have with other countries on a day-to-day -day basis, which is different from I would say foreign affairs or foreign policy. Uh, and what I'd like to do this evening is talk uh, one about how I saw these connections in my daily interactions while serving uh, the US as a foreign service officer. Uh, in some cases, history got in the way of, of our, as we tried and, and worked to achieve cooperation on issues of bilateral concern. In other cases, I found history actually played a constructive role. Uh, and in uh, more cases than not, I do confess uh, multiple times in the book to uh, not knowing the history at all. And, and that was the crux of, the, of this. I, I wanted to explore that. Um, 
And I started writing the book in 2013 uh, as a grad student at, at UMass. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and I would say that, that this confusion or shock that I experience isn't confined to foreign affairs. Uh, and we've seen in the last couple of years in the US, we're, we're in the middle of a national discussion right now about history, uh, about our national history, about our histories of communities uh, within our very borders that have been ignored and overlooked. Uh, the history of Native Americans, of African Americans, of women. And, and how do we respond to this? Do we deny it as some would want? Do we emphasize it, overemphasize it? What's a proper balance? Is this a discussion worth having at all? And so I would like to uh, lead to that kind of discussion as we move forward. Um, my question here from this book is should we as a nation also be reviewing and uncovering the role of the US overseas with all of its warts and shortcomings? And is it feasible and could it be helpful? And the answer, my answer is yes, obviously it could be helpful. Um, and the other thing that we're, we're this is September 9th, uh, 2021, and, and we're now in a moment of, of reflection on the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks, the withdrawal of the U.S. and NATO forces from Afghanistan. We're uh, in, a, in a moment of, of self-reflection now, grappling with how did this happen? When did things go wrong? Could we have worked it back? How could we have avoided it? And could history have played a role in, in helping us avoid this? So I called my book History Shock. It's a bit of a gimmick, uh, obviously related to culture shock. We all know what culture shock is. Uh, the culture shock is uh, uh, experiences, the sensations when we find ourselves in a foreign country or a foreign environment doesn't have to be outside of our borders. And we don't really understand what's going on. And, and as I traveled the world and uh, in, in, in the service of the United States, I, I was prepared for culture shock. I, I don't think I was quite so prepared for history shock, although I would say uh, culture and history are intertwined quite dramatically. Um, nowhere, I believe, does history play such a prominent role in our foreign relations as it does in Mexico. I was involved with uh, our foreign policy, foreign relations with Mexico for six years and but I wasn't in, in Mexico long before I realized that for Mexicans, their relationship to the United States really revolves around 1848 and the loss of half of their territory in the war. In my interactions at all levels in the newspapers, I would read every day, uh, I would see this, there was evidence of it. I quote the writer Carlos Fuentes from his book, El Gringo Viejo. He says, memory and resentment go hand in hand. Uh, and I used to say that uh, I, I think when the Mexicans looked in the mirror, they saw this history. They saw 1848. I, on the other hand, knew of 1848, but I didn't know much about it. And I, like many of us, we preferred to forget. Now, I'm not alone. In the book, I describe a survey that was undertaken by a group in San Diego called the Link Lincoln and Mexico Project. They traveled the length of the border, marking the original boundaries of Mexico and, and the United States, the pre-1848 boundaries. And they encountered, and I quote, only a few people who barely seemed to grasp that Mexico once encompassed all of present day Arizona, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, more than half of Colorado, and smaller portions of Wyoming, Kansas, and Oklahoma. I began to notice their little incidents uh, on a, almost on a daily basis, not the grand stuff of diplomacy of negotiations, but small encounters where the Mexican view of their history with the US got in the way, obstructed cooperation. I described several of them in the book, uh, an incident at the uh, archeological site with Madeleine Albright at Monte Alban near Oaxaca, the launching of a, a military organization <clears throat> Uh, after 9-11 called North, the Northern Command that was supposed to do for uh, North America, uh, what Central, Central Command does for, uh, it was an organizational effort uh, 
uh, a way to organize our interactions overseas, military interactions and cooperation with other countries uh, that was totally misinterpreted in Mexico, largely because of their history. Uh, and, and a lot of these uh, really had to do with not knowing. And, and I'd like to read a little section uh, of a story that had to do with um, a funeral for a Mexican soldier in Mexico, in, in outside of Mexico City. Uh, and I'll start with uh, a phone call that I was having with the uh, with someone, and, and I'm quoting myself starting off. And they go, so here we go. They actually interrupted the funeral. They're not going to let you leave. I was asking for clarification from Jim Dick Meyer, the embassy's press attaché. He had just finished telling me over the phone that he and other embassy officers were in a standoff with a unit from the Mexican army at a funeral where a young Mexican soldier killed in service in Iraq received his US citizenship in service to the United States. A funeral in Guanajuato, Mexico, a US military funeral, posthumous citizenship on July 4. So many elements of those five incomplete sentences touched so many of the wrong nerves in Mexico. I should not have been shocked. On many levels, Americans' contentious interactions with, with Mexicans inside government at universities, with journalists or artists or people at church, ran counter to Mexicans' reputation for warmth and fun, civility and politeness. But not far beneath the surface lies their collective memory of American intervention and loss. The result is an ingrained instinct to protect their sovereignty. Such instinct led one former US ambassador to Mexico, Jeffrey David, out to refer to the relationship between the United States and Mexico in the title of his book as the bear and the porcupine, with the United States as the clumsy bear and Mexico crouched in a sharp, quilled, defensive posture. The funeral on the weekend of July 4th, 2004, brought these sentiments of Mexican sovereignty face to face with contemporary issues of immigration, and reaction to 9-11 and the resulting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. As the war proceeded, stories filtered out in Mexico, not only of Mexican Americans serving in the US Armed Forces, but also of Mexicans enlisting in the US military. You could almost hear the head scratching. How can a Mexican raised on the history of American trampling on Mexican sovereignty possibly enlist on the side of the great invader. How can a Mexican participate in and support yet another invasion of some other country? It was only a matter of time before the first Mexican and Mexican-American casualty, casualties occurred. Lance Corporal Juan Lopez Rangel was killed in action in Iraq. His parents wanted their son buried in their hometown, San Luis de la Paz in Guanajuato in Mexico. They did not want to bury him in their adopted home in Georgia. Further, the parents had the right to and asked for a US military funeral, which fell to the US embassy to support. And this should have been exclusively the purview of the defense attaché's office. But as they began their preparations to receive the casket with an accompanying color guard, Coordinating with their Mexican counterparts, one issue quickly became a stumbling block. The color guard carried weapons. When officials in both the Mexican defense and foreign relations ministries opposed the idea of a 21 gun salute, the Marines opted for ceremonial rifles, which could not even fire blanks. They were wooden replicas. Sure enough, as the color guard marched away from the from the site, Mexican soldiers approached them demanding the rifles. With the funeral interrupted, a press frenzy ensued, prompting a flurry of phone calls from US Ambassador Tony Garza, many others from our embassy to our counterparts in the foreign and defense ministries. After 45 minutes, the Mexican soldiers departed without the ceremonial rifles, allowing the funeral to proceed. The dignity of the funeral was tainted, however. And so this was, uh, a Mexican unit that was had grown up opposed to 
American weapons on Mexican soil, even if they were as limited as uh, uh, ceremonial wooden rifles, painted rifles. Uh, they did not want that image uh, on their soil and they felt they had to protect it. And this was, uh, uh, I believe, 1848 and interventions uh, during the Mexican Revolution in the early 1900s were, came right to the fore and uh, we didn't fully grasp the depth of sentiment uh, as we did this. Now, this wasn't a big issue. It, it was front page news the next day in Mexico. It went away quickly, but this is the kind of, of history shock that uh, uh, kept occurring. Uh, and so when, when I retired, I really wanted to explore what was going on. What is this history and foreign relations? And so that's when I enrolled at UMass Amherst to explore this. And, and as I did, I, I began to notice what was going on in Mexico also was repeated in other assignments. I, I, I recalled other incidents where history played a role in South Africa and Canada and Peru and Haiti, Cuba. These were my personal experiences. And, and as I delved into the histories of these countries, I, one recurring question kept arising, how come I didn't know this? Why wasn't I aware that the U.S. had occupied Haiti for 19 years, beginning in 1915, that atrocities had occurred, that the U.S. Congress had investigated them, that we had resorted to the French system of forced labor, the hated corvée, in a country that was alone in the world in its success rebelling against forced labor of slavery? Why didn't I know that up to 11,000 people may have died because of bloody guerrilla fighting over those 19 years? And other histories also shocked me. I didn't remember in any history text the fact that Americans burned the city of York, that's now Toronto, in the War of 1812, well before the British burned Washington, D.C. In fact, the British burned, people say, in retaliation for us burning Toronto. I hadn't heard of Teddy Roosevelt's blatant grab of Panama, manufacturing a revolt against Colombian rule to send in American forces and restore order so that he could build a canal across the isthmus when the Colombians had already denied him. It was a maneuver of manufacturing a crisis that we repeated in Guatemala and Nicaragua and Iran, perhaps in Congo, and we attempted at the Bay of Pigs. I should have known how prominently the Platt Amendment played in Cuba, but my knowledge of the Spanish-American War in 1898 was limited to Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. The Platt Amendment after the war was passed and gave the U.S. To, the right to intervene in Cuba, gave us exercise, allowed us uh, control over all of Cuba's foreign and military policies uh, and, and ceded on a lease basis the uh, 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 the base of uh, Guantanamo. And that stood until 1934 when FDR uh, removed it, but kept the base and kept paying the leases. And, but Platt uh, became shorthand across the continent for U.S. interventionism. Platt became shorthand that Fidel Castro used repeatedly in his speeches when he first uh, took power in Cuba and for many years after. In Nigeria, I didn't know that Malcolm X had been there uh, in 1964, 10 years before me, uh, uh, 20 years before I'd been there, and that his statements about American diplomats trying to sugarcoat race relations in the US as progress still resonated with the Nigerians when we did just that. We talked about progress and civil rights in the United States over and over again. Uh, in that, but they remembered in fact, that Malcolm X had warned them 20 years earlier of American diplomats. Uh, and I began to lump all these incidents together and, and, and under the rubric of history shock and the sentence and the question was, why didn't I know that? And whenever I asked that, I thought, that's a history shock. And so the book um, talks about uh, different case studies of, in Mexico, Canada, Nigeria, South Africa, Peru, Haiti, Cuba, and delves into the incidents, my personal encounters, and then a little bit of the history that actually transpired and some of the histories that the other, the foreigners had that I, I had either a competing version or no history at all. Um, 
And I had some conclusions about why I didn't know this history as well. Uh, and I, I lay claim to ignorance, uh, even though I had studied uh, history at university and taught it uh, in schools before joining. I had passed a foreign service exam that emphasized knowledge of US history. I also talked about, uh, but it wasn't enough, obviously. And I talked about, we, we're, ours is a culture that looks forward and not back. Ours is a culture that's built a narrative that we're, we are a country uh, that, that's exceptional. We're an indispensable nation and things that bump up against that view, that narrative we tend to overlook. And we have a foreign service that moves people around every couple of years so that we don't develop uh, uh, clientitis, but it also means we don't develop a truly in-depth understanding. We have, a, a foreign service that emphasized generalists, not specialists. Uh, we have a very limited, and I just saw some, a chat thing come up. We had very limited foreign tr formal training. Outside of uh, language study, uh, we got a two week, um, <clears throat> a two week uh, tra training, what they called area studies on the entire continent. So when I was going to Peru, I had two weeks of Latin America. And most of that was on things unrelated to history. And so when I arrived in Peru, I, I really had the only things I knew about Peru were what I myself had on my own initiative sought to find out. And the Foreign Service really requires that and, and expects that uh, people will, this will do on the job training and learn this on their own. Uh, the military doesn't uh, expect that or require or, or, or expect people to learn on their own. They have, uh, they emphasize heavily history in their uh, academies, uh, whether it's uh, West Point or Annapolis, history has a huge role. The military has uh, foreign military area officers who go out and serve in embassies around the, around the world. And th those officers, are, are given a master's degree before they go out. And they're also sent overseas for one year to just study up before. Now you compare that with the uh, diplomats, we get two weeks uh, on the whole continent, not just on, on uh, the one country. So it is, and this is one of my arguments that uh, seems to have uh, a little bit of resonance in the foreign service right now, as people are looking at this. And also, again, like I said, um, history shock isn't related to just uh, overseas. Uh, I, in the past couple of years, I've heard people say, why didn't I know about the massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921? Why had I never heard of Juneteenth? It's now a national holiday. Why didn't I know the first enslaved people arrived in the U.S. in 1619, a year before Plymouth? And why didn't I know that Mohicans right here in Berkshire County had their own trail of tears of forced removals to New York State and then on to Wisconsin? So for discussion purposes, uh, I pose this question, what should we be doing with this information, if anything? If it gets in the way of managing our relations with other countries, shouldn't we be doing something? So I have a chapter in the book, uh, called Reithlang, and it's really about the role of apology. And, and I draw from a, a book, uh, a history book written by a woman named Jennifer Lund called Sorry States. And she chronicles the statements and actions of Germany and Japan in the years following World War II. As early as 1951, Germany started paying reparations. In a very famous image in 1970, German Chancellor Willy Brandt fell to his knees at a memorial to the thousands of Jews who lost their lives in the Warsaw Ghetto. The spontaneous gesture became a symbol of German atonement uh, for the Nazis. And, and Lynn goes on to conclude that failure to acknowledge, and I quote, past aggression and atrocities can fuel distrust and elevate threat perception. And so here again, I say, failure to acknowledge past aggression and atrocities can fuel distrust and elevate threat perception. But Lund also says that 
there's a backlash politically for leaders who take steps to atone or apologize for past behaviors. And I, I talk about in the book, uh, Mitt Romney and his campaign book uh, prior to running for president was called No Apology. He painted Obama as the apology president going on apology tours of Europe. Um, George Bush Sr. also made the comment, I will never apologize for the United States in his campaign. And he said this in relation, right after the uh, shoot down of the Iranian civil airliner in the Persian Gulf in 1988. But the fact of the matter, and you know them as well as I, there are instances of American apology, and whether it's Japanese internment, or we did apologize for the takeover in Hawaii uh, in the late 1800s, that, there was an, a formal apology issued in the late 1990s. The British apologize and pay reparations for their role of torture in the Mau Mau rebel rebellions in Canada. We're seeing now Canada is paying reparations for their boarding schools for First Nations. And Warren Christopher, when he was Secretary of State, apologized for the State Department inaction in the face of an atrocity in El Salvador during their civil war. So is apology the only response? And, and I would say, no, it's not. I think history or remembering better is one response as well. Recognizing and acknowledging our past behavior is on a continuum of atonement. And I quote the sociologist Irving Goffman about this continuum that he says it's acknowledging, disavowing, repenting, and offering restitution. When Obama went to Hiroshima in 2016, there was a widely publicized debate in advance of whether Obama would apologize. A lot of people thought he would, but he didn't. Instead, he laid a wreath and he made some comments about eliminating nuclear weapons in the future. It was a very simple gesture, not an apology, but a recognition of this terrible, difficult moment. And the Japanese prime minister at the time, Abe, came to Pearl Harbor and he also laid a wreath. O Obama was not the first president to lay a wreath, obviously. And I wanna read uh, a little section in here uh, from Harry Truman, who went to Mexico City, the first uh, president uh, who went to Mexico City. Uh, presidential visits to foreign countries often raise the prospect of participating in remembrance ceremonies. In Mexico, the visit of Harry Truman in 1947 included a wreath laying that ended up reshaping the nature of the bilateral relationship, at least in the short term. The first sitting U.S. president to show interest in visiting Mexico, Truman heeded the advice of his Mexican host to avoid traveling there in, 18, in 1948, the 100th anniversary of the end of the war, which saw the loss of almost half Mexico's territory to the United States. Determined to go though, to press for Mexico's support in launching a new multilateral organization in the hemisphere, Truman advanced the timing for his visit uh, to avoid the association with that conflict. He went a year earlier. And after laying a wreath at the Angel of Independence monument along the Central Avenue Reforma, Truman proceeded to Chapultepec Park to see the monument to the Niños Héroes, six tall columns in a plaza, one for each of the soldiers who threw themselves off the walls of Chapultepec Castle, rather than being taken prisoner by invading forces, U.S. forces in 1848. The recommendation to lay a wreath for the Niños Héroes, uh, child heroes, uh, came from Walter Thurston, the U.S. ambassador who had heard from his Mexican counterparts that such a gesture would obliterate any lingering traces of bitterness over the war. That's a direct quote. Truman's stop produced the intended effect, at least temporarily. A huge spontaneous outpouring of emotion sprang from witnesses and spread through the country. 
reaching the Mexican president who called Truman the new champion of hemispheric solidarity. A New York Times account of the ceremony reported that, I quote, tears of emotion streamed down the faces of the honor guard composed of cadets at the Colegio Militar, now housed in Chapultepec Castle. And as the president drove off, men wiped their eyes, end quote. The reef laying helped usher in a period of unprecedented cooperation between the two nations, which included Mexico signing the Rio Treaty in September of, 1840, of 1947, establishing in the hemisphere the principle of reciprocal assistance when attacked by outside forces. A year later, the Organization of American States was launched with Mexico as one of the founding members. Both of those instruments were still functioning more than 40 years later when the OAS activated the Rio Treaty of Mutual Defense in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, Colin Powell was Secretary of State and he happened to be in, in Peru at, on 9-11 at, at a meeting of the Organization of the American States. And right there, they, they uh, uh, took one of the articles from that document that had been negotiated in 1947 and agreed to defend uh, the United States under attack as the OAS called for. And, and as Jennifer Lind said, this kind of recognition of the past helps the relationship move forward. Uh, I would just say, just as an aside, uh, even though I served in Mexico for five years, I had never heard of Truman's reef line. It never came up. And so that's why I use uh, the, the uh, temporarily uh, in, in the comments in the book. But what Truman did in that act was acknowledge what was important to Mexico in its view of history. Our memory of the War of 1848 is limited, mostly confined to the Alamo, which happened years before the war started. And maybe the Marine hymn from the halls of Montezuma referring to Chapultepec Castle. Truman's gesture was an easy one. It was a remembrance of war, of a loss incurred by Mexico, and their use of these Nino's airways as a way to salvage dignity out of the loss of the war. Uh, I have two more examples in the book where I think US, the, the US has used history to advance our foreign relations. Uh, one was a cultural property agreement that we had with Peru uh, that, that required us, we agreed to return stolen artifacts to Peru. We signed that agreement. It was negotiated before my arrival, but within the first week of my arrival, we had the formal signing of this agreement. Peru had a terrible, uh, terrible um, experience with its archaeology being looted and making its way uh, to foreign countries to and actually to people right in Peru. Part of Peru's uh, responsibility under that agreement was that it would do more itself. Uh, to prevent looting. Um, and so what we did every couple of months in, in Peru was um, <clears throat> we would have a, a big ceremony where uh, the US customs would have seized objects that were obviously looted, objects of gold, objects of Peruvian pottery, objects from Machu Picchu, Peru has perhaps uh, with Mexico and Egypt and, and Greece and I mean, India, many places of uh, archaeological pre-Columbian sites, uh, but they, and, and one archaeologist I worked with in Peru said, Peru's only really found out about 10% of all the archaeology, archaeological sites they have. And in fact, after I left, the um, Peruvians found and unearthed the largest city in the Americas, pre-Columbian city along the coast of Peru that when, when I was there, nobody even knew it existed. Um, anyway, our ambassador was, uh, would appear at these events to, um, <clears throat> to turn back these artifacts. Inevitably, the, the media would cover this, but then they would ask him a question that had to do with the, the dismal human rights situation in Peru at the time under the president Fujimori, who was 
had turned a, a fight against terrorism in Peru to uh, uh, to problematic human rights issues. Our ambassador kept talking and, and trying to hold Peru to respect for human rights at great criticism from uh, from the, from Peruvians who were really happy that Fujimori had gotten a handle on on terrorism, but also were beginning to wonder uh, what this meant for human rights in the country. And, and our ambassador kept hammering. He he would drive by walls that were said "Jet, go home." I was personally criticized in the media myself because I was uh, the one of the people involved with. Uh, talking about human rights with the a member of the country team. But what the way this was connected with history was the Peruvians would see our ambassador returning these artifacts that were of huge importance to them, that mattered to them uh, tremendously. They were so proud of their archaeological, of their pre-Columbian past. And so th they gave the ambassador a little bit of the benefit of the doubt as he spoke about human rights and was critical of the government. And uh, one colleague used to call this uh, filling up the reservoir of goodwill. And so uh, we spent a lot of time and in, in this, we did with these uh, artifacts from, from uh, uh, seized artifacts, we spent a lot of time letting Peruvians know because it filled up the well of goodwill that allowed the ambassador to then go out and make comments about human rights that were also very important to the, to advancing uh, our uh, national interests. The second example I have was um, undertaken uh, in Haiti following the, uh, and I have a chapter on Haiti in the book, uh, following the earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010, uh, you will remember the just the uh, devastation there. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives immediately. I lost a colleague there, a cultural officer, who was at her home and the home pancaked and she was uh, gone instantly. Um, and, and buildings and government operations uh, ceased. The airport was a uh, un planes couldn't fly into the airport. We were getting shipments in earlier. And the world responded in a huge way. We had a, uh, a very large military contingent went down uh, to try to work and, and help the Peruvians in their recovery and relief to provide food and water and electricity and get the airport back up and running. And it was something that only the U.S. military could do. It was a, a, a uh, terrific effort by many people over many months. Um, and in the middle of this, the Smithsonian says they want to go down. Well, the embassy was saying, no, we have thousands of people here. We don't need a museum coming down to Haiti in the middle of this when we're trying to preserve and save lives. Well, uh, the, the Smithsonian came anyway. They had been approached by their counterparts uh, who worked in the, the National Archives and other art organizations in Peru that were devastated. Huge monuments of churches and murals were just wrecked. And, and the Smithsonian understood right away the importance of these uh, organizations and, and this art and this cultural heritage to Haiti's sense of pride, even in the midst of uh, terrible devastation. And, and the Smithsonian made the case and they worked with, they went down there and they worked uh, over many, many months to restore and protect and cover these items. There was a hurricane season coming up and they, uh, they were just devastated. The Smithsonian made the case and they didn't have to make a big case because we remember from our own history, but they said, imagine if, uh, if Washington had been destroyed and we somebody had to protect the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, we would have done everything to protect that, even in the uh, face of loss of life. And uh, one of the few memories we all have of the War of 1812 is Dolly Madison doing just that, saving the portrait of Washington out of the White House. And so this kind of um, use of history that the Smithsonian 
uh, did in a devastating earthquake really, I think, mattered to the Haitians who are very, have a very uh, proud sense of history and dignity in, in their identity. So I, I leave with, uh, ju I just want to close a couple of comments and, and how do we improve this? How do we improve our historic our historical literacy and awareness. And, and I talk about, I've talked about training in these two weeks, uh, but I cite a, a book in, the, in, in my book that was called Thinking in Time, written by two Harvard political scientists named Ernest May and Richard Neustadt, who did case studies on applying history in government decision-making. They did case studies on, uh, and it wasn't just foreign affairs, but they did do uh, the Bay of Pigs, they did, uh, the Peloponnesian War, they did social security, and, and they talk about how we can, as in government, uh, improve our historical literacy. They talk about a, an, an amorphous concept of bettering our historic sensibility. Well, that doesn't mean much, but they actually give a process for decision-making that includes a pause. And in that pause, they recommend looking and exploring analogies and from historic and how close they are and what could and what are the consequences of certain decision making based on history. And, and they just call it a pause. And, and I would say that uh, um, that pause is, is what John F. Kennedy did uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He waited overnight when many of his advisors were uh, recommending bombing uh, Cuba. But he had a historian on his staff, Arthur Schlesinger, who had written a long memo uh, before the Bay of Pigs saying, don't do this. Uh, and he, but his was a lone voice. He also had a brother. He had read The Guns of August himself by uh, Barbara Tuckman and was, knew how easily and quickly uh, nations go to war uh, based on the experience of uh, Europe in 1914. So he, he did something that was unusual, but it allowed, it was a pause and it allowed Khrushchev to also pause and pull back. And, and so I think there are ways that we can apply a history uh, to big decision-making and small decision-making. I didn't know, but I found out today this isn't new. I mean, I, I found today that George Mason University has a program called uh, History, Memory, and, and Conflict. You know, again, why, why isn't the Foreign Service in sending people there, or why aren't they? And they may be. I don't know, but I certainly was not aware of. I knew there was a George Mason School of Conflict Resolution at the time. So let me stop, and, and I'm happy to, to uh, hear from you. And, and your comments uh, laid out a, a lot for discussion. Uh, what are we to do if we acknowledge the negative repercussions of our US actions outside our borders? And I think it is particularly relevant now on the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And as we explore what happened in Afghanistan, could we have done this better? Uh, anyway, so let me stop there rambling and uh, hear from you all in one form or another. Thank you so much, John. That was definitely not rambling. That was uh, extremely thoughtful and compelling. I encourage people to put their questions and comments um, into the chat and I will read them for everyone. Um, the first one was um, from Richard who um, asked, what was the name of, I believe it was Carlos Fuentes book um, about Mexico that you had mentioned that had so, the quote. It, it is translated, in, and it's probably Fuentes' uh, most famous book, or certainly in the United States. It's called El Gringo Viejo, The Old Gringo. Uh, it's a Thank short you. book, uh, a fiction book of fiction. And Ben notes, in the book you note, in your book you note that American politicians feel they need to emphasize American exceptionalism and always a force for good in the world. God forbid they apologize for past American actions, which you addressed at, as, as after he read that as well. And Charlotte asks, um, isn't this an ongoing problem with having the ambassadorship 
being selected friends and donors with no historical or cultural knowledge of the country they're assigned and why we continue to have difficulties? Um, I wouldn't say it's confined to political ambassadors. I have, and I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I worked for three political ambassadors, one of whom was the governor of our state, uh, Paul Salucci, uh, uh, went up to be governor in Canada. I went up to be ambassador to Canada, uh, was a very good ambassador. And in fact, the, the quote you just said, I remember Paul Salucci as he was departing, uh, he, the prime minister had thrown a, a small dinner for him and he, and he stood up, Paul Salucci, and said, the United States, I still believe, has been a force for good around the world. Uh, I don't want to lose sight of that. I do think that in many ways we we are still a force for good. We still still do have um, soft power of attraction, and it's not always government related. Uh, but one way we can probably increase our force for good is uh, by recognizing when it hasn't been that good, uh, and, and uh, acknowledging. Uh, what's important to other countries. Um, so let me just say on the political ambassadors, one of the most important things that a foreign country wants for the US representative to be there is if they wanna get a message directly to the White House, they, they go to the ambassador or to somebody high up. And so people uh, who were political ambassadors are friends of the president quite often, and they pull that card. Uh, Paul Salucci, his best friend was the chief of staff, Andrew Card, who was also a, uh, uh, a representative in the, in the House, uh, a Republican. And so whenever Salucci needed to call and get a message through to George Bush, he, he could call up Andrew Card. We didn't do text back then, but uh, he got an answer right away. And the same was true with other ambassadors who uh, had that kind of connection. And, and I would just say uh, my last ambassador in Canada was a, um, a man named David Wilkins. He was the Speaker of the House in uh, South Carolina. He had been outside of the US one time in his life to Canada. And shortly after he arrived, the New Republic put a cover out of Bush's worst appointments. And there was David Wilkins' picture on the cover. That's, that was his introduction. And, and what I would say is David Wilkins was one of the most effective ambassadors we had in Canada ever. Uh, he was extraordinarily personable. He pulled the South, the South Carolina charm uh, that the Canadians loved, and he made fun of himself, and he did all the right things, and he even did a little finger pointing, but he got away with it because of that Southern charm and because of his connections uh, right into the White House. So I'm a big fan of political ambassadors and career ambassadors as well. I don't wanna diss them. You're a fan of good ambassadors. I'm a fan of and I work <laughs> for good ambassadors. I work for great ambassadors, uh, really uh, terrific. I respect and admire them all. And, and uh, there are people out there I probably wouldn't have, but I had the good luck to work for great ambassadors. That's good to hear. Um, Richard says he's a retired 32 year foreign service officer. And he writes, our lack of knowledge of history, foreign languages, religions, and culture leads directly to disasters like our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I wonder if you wanted to talk a bit more about Afghanistan. There's a couple of other questions as well. Yeah, so I have, uh, obviously we're all grappling with this right now. One of the issues in um, Afghanistan for foreign service people is it was a uh, danger by no, no, and, and people recruited to go there for assignments of one year. And they went in, they had, they went out for R&R &R and, and they got two, trips home or wherever they wanted because it was such a dangerous assignment. But what can you learn in a year? And you're sitting in an embassy and uh, you're surrounded by security. You have to have special permission from the military to go out. So your opportunity to really understand what was going on in Afghanistan, the history and the culture was 
you know, I respect all my foreign co my colleagues who went there under great duress, uh, without spouses, and uh, but I really do feel that our 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 knowledge of Afghanistan was limited by that simple fact, uh, and. <clears throat> You know, I was walking uh, with a friend of mine who worked in Afghanistan and he was talking about, you know, that, and he was with CARE and, and I think he's even on the call. Uh, he said that uh, we, he knows that we did a lot of good there. We built roads, we built schools and, and there were um, infrastructure in Afghanistan. And I didn't say this to him at the time, but it pulled me back to, our experience in Haiti in the early 1900s, when we were occupying that country for 19 years with military. And what did we do? We built roads, we built schools. And when we look back at the time on departing Haiti, uh, we were proud of the schools and the roads and the hospitals we built. Well, that was 80 years earlier. Um, <clears throat> Did anybody, I certainly never made the connection, but here was a country like Afghanistan that we also occupied uh, for many years and tried to um, uh, tried to remake in, in whatever vision we had at the time. But the Haitians had two rebellions against us and the Haitians wanted Haiti for Haiti, uh, for Haitians. They did not want Americans there. I think the lesson out of Afghanistan was we weren't Afghanis. And, and this was a country that's fiercely independent. And the Taliban had one thing going for them all along, which was they were Afghans and we weren't. And the people who we had installed were not. We were calling the shots there and uh, uh, it just wasn't working. So uh, anyway, those are my just quick thoughts, uh, reactions about uh, Afghanistan. There's a lot of good comment out there. I saw some people talking about Dexter Filkins and a few others who are writing very good things about. There are 20 years there. Thank you. Um, Don asks, is it true as we've read that our previous president crippled the State Department by driving career diplomats away, replacing them with political hacks and refusing to fill many positions? Can we ever recover? Uh, Yes, it is true. Um, there was, and, and we all know the suspicion of the deep state, uh, and it wasn't just limited to the State Department, but it was uh, very much uh, directed at the State Department. Uh, and so people who were senior, who had a lot of knowledge, who were um, eased out in one way or another. I have a friend who was had a very senior position. He walked into a room one day, somebody slid a piece of paper across the table from him and it was his resignation letter and told him to sign it. Uh, another friend, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield was a very senior diplomat and she was moved out of her position as assistant secretary for Africa and ended up uh, leaving and is now our UN ambassador. Uh, so there were people like that, certainly at the senior leadership. The other thing that happened, and this one man who got the piece of paper across the table, uh, one of the reasons he got it was he was advocating that we continue to bring in foreign service officers to continue to have this uh, cycle of new officers coming in because otherwise you're gonna get this bubble of no officers over the next 20 years. And they did not wanna bring in new officers. Uh, and uh, so they eased him out, but what happened was the number of people applying for the State Department went down dramatically in those four years as well. Uh, can we recover? I think there was an effort, a, a number of people who had been eased out were brought back in by the Biden transition team to, to uh, look at this and to try to um, get some people to return into uh, offices. I, I have a, another man I met was the, uh, the, the um, <clears throat> the man who knew more about refugee matters, he was the head of the refugee office at the State Department uh, and was ex enormously busy. He had worked there for uh, decades and he was eased out because the president uh, 
decided to reduce the number of refugee admissions to uh, dramatically from what Obama had. He was put in an office to declassify documents. And this man who knew more about refugees than perhaps anybody in the United States was told to go over here and sit in a room and, and read documents and see if we could release them to the public, the freedom of information. So that's the kind of, those are just anecdotes, the kind of thing that had happened. Um, so. Thank you. I think we can recover and we're working on it. I think there's more, people are, are returning and, and more people are applying. It's gonna take some time. So. Thank you. So uh, Richard asks, do you know how extensive the Peace Corps country training on history compares with foreign service training? So as, as a Peace Corps volunteer myself, I would say it was probably the best training I had uh, in, in my uh, career. Uh, I, I did teacher training with Peace Corps. It was just tremendous from a teacher perspective. And uh, um, <clears throat> we did a little language, but we were immersed uh, in the culture. Not so much on history, but to, to be honest, they again were, were telling us, or they didn't even tell us, they just expected that people would read uh, and find out on their own. And, and again, I did and did a lot, uh, but there's um, probably on the history side, not enough, I would say, I would agree. Uh, there was very good training though. Great, thank you. Um, Michael asks, would acknowledging the Bay of Pigs help future relations with Cuba? Absent that, would relations ever improve? Would you recommend it? What about the political ramifications, i.e. the Miami Cubans? Yeah, so this is a really uh, complicated, and I, I do devote a chapter to Cuba in the book, and I did a, a class on Cuba for Ali uh, that moved me to write the chapter on Cuba uh, way back when. But um, <clears throat> what's interesting about Cuba is I, I think that we acknowledge the Bay of Pigs. Uh, in, in initially, Kennedy denied it, but he couldn't deny it anymore. And so we accepted it. He accepted full responsibility. Everybody knew it. It was a huge egg in the face at the time. We acknowledge it. Americans, Cuban Americans were arrested, were thrown in jail. There was a big prisoner swap. So there was recognition at the time. What we may not have acknowledged were all the other attempts to remove Castro to power for a long period of time. The, the surreptitious, they're trying to poison him uh, efforts, and we don't know the full extent of those to this date. What I found interesting in Cuba was our understanding of Cuban history goes back to 1959, the emergence of Castro. Everything we know about Cuba is, and everything we talk about Cuba is Cuba under Castro. Um, for Castro and the Cubans, their understanding of history goes back to the early 1800s when the United States wanted to annex Cuba as way back then and beginning as a uh, uh, certainly Southern uh, representatives wanted to see Cuba as, as a state in the US that would uh, allow slavery. And so there were attempts in the mid 1800s and early 1800s to bring Cuba into annex Cuba. Uh, and, and there were um, <clears throat> many different things were going on with Cuba and sugar and Cuba and slavery at the time. The Cubans tried uh, multiple times to throw off the Spanish rule. They were getting close to uh, winning the, Span the War of Independence in 1898 when the United States decided to intervene and, and push uh, Spain out in, in a big way. And we came in as the victors, whereas the Cubans were, had been fighting for years and years and we ignored what the Cubans had been doing when, when peace agreement was uh, arranged with Cuba. And here's again, echoes of Afghanistan. We made the uh, peace agreement with Spain and did not have Cubans in the room. Uh, certainly nobody who were who was uh, fighting for uh, Cuban independence at the time. And so when Castro was 
engaged in his own uh, revolution and shortly thereafter, he kept referring to all these incidents of American intervention in Cuba, the Platt Amendment. He went back, his knowledge of, of the United States role in uh, Cuba was much greater and longer. And he used that throughout uh, his 50 plus year rule in Cuba, whereas we only focused on this one uh, event. I think there is a problem with Cuba, as I think Michael uh, referred to, is political. Um, and, and it is only really a political issue. The Castro brothers and the current rulers in Cuba use the United States as a way to legitimize their rule and complain and excuse their uh, totalitarian uh, uh, behavior, authoritarian behavior, and the United States uses that and we don't focus on Cuba. We, we kind of raise it prior to elections when Florida is important, perhaps. And, and it's only uh, very briefly do we jump into Cuba and then we jump out. It's just not important except, but it is important to a very few people, uh, a few members of Congress. It's hugely important uh, to them, but not to the uh, body politic at all. There, have, there has been movement of the Miami Cubans politically Obama, when he was running for president in 2008, he was very upfront. He said, I'm going to do what I can. I, I will meet with uh, Castro if uh, I will reach out. And uh, this is a, a, a position that uh, hasn't worked for 40 years. And why are we continuing to, uh, 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 to do something that hasn't worked? And, and, and he still, I think he did win Florida that year and, and won a majority of the Cuban Americans in Cuba. So they were ready for a change too. It's now re returned perhaps to a more hostile relationship. Thank you. And, and someone did mention that, um, that in the South, there was a push to annex Cuba um, in the 1840s and 50s, which I had not heard before. Um, William, uh, who recommend, has recommended a couple of readings. One is a short book from 1944 by the British military historian B.H. Little Hart, Why Don't We Learn From History? So people are, have been asking this question for a while, as well as Chalmer Johnson's blowback and Dexter Filkin's recent piece in The New Yorker. I think that's about uh, Afghanistan. And then, um, oop, I lost the name, but someone wrote, uh, I experienced history shock regarding US history after reading Jill Lepore's These Truths. So a number of people have mentioned how here in the United States, as you um, mentioned, that we don't know our own history and that that, that is a drawback in having, you know, honest and informed conversations among ourselves as well as with others. Yeah, and I would say that uh, <clears throat> as much as it's being politicized now, this whole discussion of history and what can be taught in schools and what can't be taught, I think it's a very useful uh, dialogue, if there is a dialogue, that we're, at least we're understanding that history is important, whereas Perhaps before it wasn't even, uh, uh, and, and in fact, the, the enrollments in the history uh, departments around the country has been, has been on the decline uh, as well. Uh, but so, so I think that I think the emphasis is a good emphasis uh, that we're at least talking about it. Yeah, it feels like part of the American sort of uh, mythology is to always push ever forward and you know not look back in a way you know that that sort of our orientation and then that does not does not serve us well often. Uh, Karen uh, notes a similar example is another push to annex Quebec into the US in the late 1800s and early 1900s. She says that Boston's help to Halifax during the World War I weapons explosion in Halifax Harbor sending doctors, nurses and supplies really helped to improve US-Canada relations. Yeah, and that's an incident I talk about in the book that uh, because um, I, I cite in a conversation I had with a senior Canadian government person after 9-11. The Canadians were just tremendous after 9-11. Uh, planes landed across Canada and uh, 
ordinary Canadians took people in who were stranded there in places like Gander and Halifax and just dozens and dozens of planes. The, the scene outside the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa was just full of flowers. Uh, it was just knee-jerk automatic solidarity with the United States at the time. Um, <clears throat> but I asked a, uh, a Canadian official, you know, when did we, did, can you recall any time that we had that kind of reaction or we helped you? <laughs> and they had no idea. And they pause and they just, that was the end of, it wasn't the end of the conversation, but it was, uh, it was, uh, he could not think of one instance. Well, obviously the biggest one is the, uh, uh, one obvious one is the one that was, that Karen cited, which was the response after the Halifax explosion. And there's a wonderful book about that, that uh, the Canadians were stunned that ordinary Americans in Boston came in huge ways to, to support them uh, at the time. And, and uh, those of us in Massachusetts know that every year, uh, uh, Nova Scotia sends us a Christmas tree that we place in uh, Boston uh, as uh, for our Christmas um, holiday season. But there were other examples, obviously, where we work with Canada and cooperate with Canada. I was involved in some of them as well uh, that uh, they acknowledge of our assistance. Thank you. Um, Cynthia writes, this was really informative. I studied language and culture in Mexico and never knew the stories of the young heroes at Chapultec wow. And she continues, the ability to apologize is important in interpersonal relationships as well as between countries. Your talk brought, broadened my thinking. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, and uh, let's see, there are, uh, someone asks, uh, what is your opinion of the current head of the State Department? So when, when the people were named for the, uh, what I would call national security positions, my immediate reaction was Biden has brought in the A-team. He's brought in people who have been there before. Blinken was a deputy secretary of state and the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, had been very involved with uh, foreign affairs for many years. And so they, they knew people around the world. They knew, um, uh, and, and they've dealt with a lot of these issues. They aren't the heavyweights that uh, Hillary Clinton or Colin Powell would be, uh, who came with a reputation, but they're serious and serious-minded people. Now, the, downs, the, the other side of this is I'm reading more and more uh, criticism of what they call the foreign policy establishment that has uh, pushed the United States into the position we're in now. Uh, and nobody, there's nobody accountable. And this foreign, they, um, a man by the name of Ben Rhodes, who worked in the Obama White House, called it the foreign policy blob, the foreign the foreign policy blob in Washington is a group think everybody moves in the same direction. Um, but, uh, and so there, people are talking about a little bit of accountability. Why are we uh, promoting our view of uh, democracy, pushing it down the throats of other countries? Why can't we uh, focus on what's important and uh, truly in our national interests? And, people ought to be accountable for that. Well, that's a different point of view. I think right, what we do have are serious-minded people who are seriously involved and engaged uh, on, on the crises of the day. And I, and I don't think they're, um, what do I want to say? They're, they're, they're not looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. They're seeing the world as it is, so. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, um... Herbert uh, asked um, if you can talk about Russia's disconnect with Europe for so many years, the historical conflict with the Mideast and the British takeover of China, you know, in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what's interesting is um, to, to both China and, and it's not just China and uh, uh, Russia, but it's Turkey, it's Hungary, 
this make America great line that we've had in the last few years is being replicated around the world where Putin uh, has been uh, pushing a make Russia great, make restore Russia to its past glory. Uh, and, and, and China as well is talking about the, uh, the, the lost centuries, the, the centuries of humiliation, they say, and China used to be the world power. And so everybody's talking about a return to, to glory. Putin is in, and, and China as well, they're in it for the long game. Uh, and people say that other countries like the Russians play foreign affairs as if they're playing uh, uh, three-dimensional chess as the Americans play, do foreign affairs like we're playing uh, poker. Uh, it's very quick and uh, uh, want to win quickly. Um, but Putin is definitely, uh, he sees that it is to Russia's advantage to break the ties between Europe and the United States, to break NATO, to uh, uh, cause dissension in the Western alliance. And that's what he's been doing uh, all along. And he'll continue to do that as long as uh, uh, I think Biden is trying to call him on some of the cyber security things right now, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, so far, so good. But I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really uh, optimistic that, that it will, will last, given what Putin wants to do. So there's a, just a couple of thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, Dag asks: We have military personnel in 150 countries. If they were brought home, would we be risking our national security or enhancing it, or would it matter? Would we be better off sending more diplomats? So the former Secretary of Defense had a great quote before Congress. He said, if you cut the State Department, you're going to have to buy me a lot more bullets. And, uh, and so I think Obama prioritized diplomacy. There's a little of that with uh, Obama, I mean, with uh, Biden right now, um, <clears throat> we do have a heavy footprint around the world. Uh, I don't know that, that um, there is yet any, I don't know, but there is any attempt to re-examine our presence around the world. There have been in the past, What? what where do we have to be? I, I would say this, that uh, <clears throat> one of the things our military does around the world is establish cooperative relationships with other militaries so that we don't have to get in there with troops that we can work with other countries. We do a lot of training exercises, for example, in South Korea with Japan, uh, with Australia. And, um, and even when I was in Latin America, every year there were training exercises that took place between the two militaries. So if something happened, we knew who to call, and we could uh, also work together with them. We knew what kind of um, equipment they had and, and when we could uh, um, interact and integrate easily. So I think there is a reason to have some kind of a presence there. Thank you. Um, and somebody asked, do you admire Jimmy Carter for his emphasis on human rights? Yes, uh, I was a big fan, huge fan of Carter when he was governor of Georgia and running for president. I was a young Peace Corps volunteer. I thought this is wonderful. I was uh, as altruistic as Carter was. Uh, Carter probably doesn't get enough credit um, be, for pushing human rights and he pushed it with the Soviet Union. He, he got them to agree to join the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that really held Gorbachev and others uh, to account uh, during the 80s uh, when they started, when they had the option, the Soviet Union and East Germany and other countries had the option to do what they had done in Hungary or in Czechoslovakia, which was bring in the tanks and stifle dissent, but they did not do that. And I think a lot of it went back to Carter and his emphasis and getting the Soviets to agree to uh, open up a little and to at least on a <clears throat> rhetorical way agree to protect human rights better. 
Thank you. Um, and uh, Jeff asks, why is the US trying to get U Ukraine into NATO? So part of this is, is um, <clears throat> First of all, I, I, I would say that we're not really trying. If we wanted and we really tried, they would be in NATO already. There is a process, a process where a country applies and they go through a series of steps. And I forget what they, it is off the top of my head. But Ukraine has, taken, has been a little slow and, and NATO has also been a little slow. They, I think we recognize what this would mean. Our officials, whether it's Blinken or others, say, oh, we're not going to pay attention to, and I heard the former ambassador to Ukraine saying our decision to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Bill Taylor, who was in the impeachment hearings, I heard him on the radio the other day, and he said, we don't pay attention to Russia in our decision whether or not to let Ukraine in NATO. Well, I, that might, might be a good talking point, but there's no doubt about it that we do. Uh, we we have to and it will be part of that decision russia responded uh when they took over crimea and put troops on the border of ukraine that, that was really in reaction to nato other countries the former soviet union uh republics have have joined nato but uh ukraine's the big one so there's a, a, i think a little bit of reluctance and, and wait and see and muddle through policy on that Thank you, John. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we uh, have had a great response from um, the audience. We haven't been able to get to all the questions, uh, but I just want to read one last um, uh, post. And then if you have any um, final words, uh, they are all uh, from Don Morrison. I'll leave you with a quote from Mark Bloch, the great French historian and resistance hero on France's defeat in World War II. Quote, our war up to the very end was a war of old men and theorists who were bogged down in errors and gendered by the faulty teaching of history, unquote. Yeah, and, and uh, I would say I would, I'm going to look into this issue for this department at George Mason University on history, memory, and conflict. Uh, it, it reminded me too that it's not just conflict where history and memory and some of the day-to-day -day occurrences that I experienced uh, were also where history and memory came into play as well. But it is as big as conflict. And, and the, the one that's most dramatic in my lifetime was the Iranian revolution uh, and the taking of the US hostages in Iran. That was definitely a uh, response to Jimmy Carter's very humane gesture to bring the Shah for medical treatment into the United States. But the Iranians thought, oh, this is Mossadegh all over again when we replaced Mossadegh with the Shah. We, and, uh, with the British, we uh, uh, arranged a coup there. And so they responded in, in a huge way with a different version of history than what we had at the time. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Ollie, very much. Uh, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. As you can see, uh, I could just keep talking. My poor wife will be listening to me for the rest of the <laughs> night because I'm just going to keep going. But anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, John. And if you would like to hear John speak more, he is one of our speakers in our fall Ollie class on hot topics, right? What is your subject? I forget. Well, very close to this. It's on patriotism versus nationalism. Ah. I will get into some of these topics as well. So that's a uh, hot topics. And then in the winter, he's going to be doing interviews with local historians and historical societies. So it'll be a focus on Berkshire County history. And in the spring, he'll be doing his annual uh, Great Decisions course. And the winter one will be online as his hot topics. Not sure about the spring because none of us are sure about spring at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will send you lots of love in the chat on um, 
I really appreciating your talk and your thoughts, um, John. And for those who are asking, we will send you a link um, where you can purchase the book. And we will also send a link to the video and you're welcome to share it with others. So again, I'd like to thank um, Ray Langsdale for um, handling everything behind the scenes wonderfully and to thank Berkshire Gas for sponsoring us and also for Pittsfield Community Television who's here with us as well. So thank you all. And our next, by the way, our next Ollie talk is in just a few days. It's on Tuesday, September 14th, and it's on the future of cryptocurrency. And they will start with a um, the basics of it for those like me who still aren't exactly sure what that is. Um, but that is also free and online. So thank you all and good night. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, John.